Hi, I'm Prithvi and uh, for those who don't know me from my LinkedIn content, I share some simple useful stuff uh, for applied machine learning engineers and data scientists. If you're one, you'd appreciate it. Um, so just in case if you're wondering, uh, what is this uh, vision language modeling series about? And what is this video about? Here's a little bit of context and I promise to keep it under a couple of minutes. Um, for the better part of the last one, one and a half years, I've been sharing a lot of content um, specific to multimodal modeling, especially in uh, vision language space. Uh, those were like LinkedIn posts, uh, blog posts, primers, some code and some notebooks, uh, some memes at times and things like that. Um, uh, but a lot of people reached out saying that this is good, but this is not enough uh, for us to move beyond and apply ourselves and solve real world problems. Um, and uh, there were a couple of revelations when people reached out to me. Uh, one is the emotion. Either people are petrified or they have the twinkle in the eye. There is no in-between emotion. And second is people are genuinely curious and interested in knowing this. So this got me thinking uh, as to how should I design the success for you? What should be the takeaways for you? And what is a good use of uh, the time for you and me, both of us? Um, so uh, hence I designed this series and I sincerely hope this will be a fun uh, and enjoyable learning experience for you. Um, so the first episode uh, is going to be like a hello world. Uh, so I've taken a, a simple variant of a complicated uh, problem and uh, I'm trying to do a hello world for the vision language modeling for you guys. So. Um, uh, in terms of audience, uh, this will be like if you are an up, if you are experienced, this will be rather easier if you have some experience in machine learning. And if you're an absolute beginner, I don't think you should be worried. It's still uh, made in such a way that it's accessible. You'll have to put in some extra work and you will be there. So with that said, uh, without further ado, uh, welcome to the very first episode of Vision Language Modeling Series and uh, we'll get into it. So let's look at some code. Uh, before we get started, I would like to define success for you guys so you know what exactly we're trying to build. As you can see from the image, uh, let's recount the idea of a visual question answering or VQA is to accept an image and accept a question in the form of text, combine them together and to come up with an answer, right? So as you can see, uh, the image on the left hand side throws a shape and the right hand side asks a, questions about, asks a question about the shape and then we are trying to make a prediction. So here the, sh the question is what kind of shape you have in the image, right? So the prediction goes a circle, right? Uh, there are a couple of different ways uh, as far as framing VQA task is concerned. Uh, we could do like a generative uh, modeling or as opposed to a discriminative modeling. For, for the sake of simplicity and for this exercise, we're going to frame this as a discriminative model. Uh, precisely what I'm going to do is to, pr uh, is to frame it as a classification task, which is basically accepting an image, accepting a text, combining them to make a prediction, right? So uh, let's get into the data set. Uh, the second section fully talks about the data set, which is obviously I'm using a data set called ECVQA, which is a much simpler variant of the VQA data sets. Uh, all about how I brought the data set, how I built the data frames, how I split them into train, validation, and test, and all these things are there. They're pretty self-explanatory. I would request you to go through that. The key takeaway for you is for us to frame it as a classification task, we need to first look at all the possible answers because the answers are the labels. As you can see, there are about 13 unique answers, and then we are done converting them into numbers to use them as labels. So that's the only thing you want to make a note of here. And uh, here is a simple preview of the actual data set. Like you have the question, you have the, the answer in the form of text, and then the image, uh, the path from the image comes in, and then the, in the numerical form of the answer, which will become the label, right? So that's the second section. So the next logical section is, of course, we have image and text, so that means we have to be able to some way, shape, or form extract the features of the image, extract the features of the text, and then bring them together in some way, and then make the prediction, right? So the first step is, what are those feature backbones or feature extractors uh, we need, right? So as far as image goes, as everybody knows, we can uh, either uh, depend on a CNN-based architecture, or we can depend on a uh, transformer-based architecture, but text, the latest and greatest is transformers. I'm not going to go back to word to wake glow for this exercise. I'm going to keep it simple and I'm going to resort to a, a transformer, text-based transformer. Uh, I'm sorry, transformer for the text extraction. Uh, so that's what, that's exactly what this uh, section is all about. 
So uh, either as I've shown, I've commented the portion where you can use actually a CNN based architecture, um, uh, which you can uncomment and play when I give you the notebook. And uh, uh, what you're seeing uncommented is um, a simple BERT based transformer getting loaded uh, to be used as a feature extractor for the text part and then uh, VAT base is getting loaded to be used as a feature extracted for our image part. That's it. Uh, we move them to with the respective as GPU or CPU and that's all uh, pretty self-explanatory, right? And the next uh, logical step is once we have the uh, feature backbones and we have the data frames, we'll have to stitch them together to form the actual data set. So here is a simple class uh, for the easy VQA data set uh, where I've uh, use the data frames and the feature backbones to extract the data and feed it to our model for our training purposes and uh, again it is pretty self-explanatory as you can see there's a commented portion which shows how we can use CNN as a v, uh, vision backbone to extract features and the rest of it is uh, transformers for vision and transformers for language so the thing that you have to take a note is once the features are extracted. There are three different inputs that are going into our model. One is the embedding of the image, one is uh, the embedding of the text and the actual label itself, right? So once this is done, uh, the next logical step is to figure out a, a way to get the image and text together. That's what we're going to see in the next step. Just hang on with me, right? Uh, and this is the stage where we are actually using the class we defined in the previous cell and extracting the data set and then converting them into data loaders. These are pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to get into that. And then defining an accuracy function, which we're going to use in our actual training loop. Uh, before getting into the actual modeling portion, the simple PyTorch training loop, which we're going to use for the training exercise, is shown here. Again, it is a pretty self-explanatory. Uh, uh, a couple of things we might notice is uh, here you can see how the image and the text embedding are coming in as an input and then I'm using as a, using the labels and the outputs to calculate the loss. Uh, these are pretty straightforward. You could see that I'm using a convenient uh, log file for logging every step of the model, model training. And uh, you could notice that I'm saving useful checkpoints, every single useful checkpoint. Uh, these are some of the things you can take in order, but there is nothing earth shattering here. There's a pretty simple um, training loop here. The next step is a pretty interesting thing. That's the section, uh, section six. This is where we're going to look at uh, how we are going to take the image embedding and the text embedding and then bring them together, fuse them uh, in some way, shape or form to form a form a singular feature and then make the prediction right so there are a couple of different fusions like i said uh, we have the cnn backbone for vision as well as transformer so i have defined 6a and 6b two different fusion networks one with using cnn one with using uh, vat i'm going to talk about the uh, both of them uh, here uh, as you can see in terms of the network itself it is not complicated so the forward is basically accepting the image uh, embedding uh, parameter that we passed before and the text embedding parameter uh, when we say fusion uh, what we are trying to say here is we want to figure out a way to make the vision and the language modalities to interact in some way shape or form so they can uh, meaningfully form a unique uh, feature vector which will help us make the prediction that's what we are meaning here right so here what I've chosen is to keep things simple uh, we are just going to do an element wise product of both the vectors coming out of the feature both the feature vectors coming out of vision and language right uh, but there are certain nuances required and I'll explain that uh, if you have further questions we could you could always come back to me right so uh, we are accepting the image features we are normalizing them and then we are projecting it down and projecting it up. Uh, in the case of vision, it is projecting it down. In the case of text, it is projecting up. And I'll explain that because, uh, again, it's pretty self-explanatory. The CNN model we are using is ResNet 50, which is obviously giving features in 2048 dimensions. And the text uh, uh, feature extract, which is BERT, base, and case, which is giving in 512. You obviously have to have, uh, you cannot have two different dimensions to make an element-wise product. So I basically have to bring in, basically trying to bring both the different uh, feature vectors from different dimensions to common dimension. That's what we are doing here, right? So once that is done, uh, you have uh, uh, nothing special to do. You just have to actually make the feature interaction. When the feature interaction is done, I've just made sure that there is a learning parameter is defined, which is W, and then that is getting matrix multiplied with 
the uh, feature that we have just created here right that's what's happening here once that is done i'm just passing it through a fully connected layer making a batch normalization as you can notice right 768 plus 768 uh, you know 768 itself is a lot of parameters for making a prediction here uh, in terms of dimensions right so we are just uh, making sure that uh, you know, we want to introduce some kind of regularization eff effect here, so hence the dropout, and then finally I'm passing it to the final linear layer, which is basically um, going to convert and give us uh, the features into 13 uh, different layers, make the actual make make the actual prediction here, right? So that's what is happening here. Um, and, and and if you if you ask me why each why, what is the choice, why 0.3 for uh, you know. Uh, the dropout Y256 for the first connect. These are just experiments. It's not a formula. You can experiment with it and then you could probably improve the performance of the model. There is nothing set on stone here. These are purely experimental stuff. And that's the first network. Let's look at the second network, which is the mid fusion network. Um, and here we don't have the complication of a CNN model as being out a different uh, as being out a feature of different size like 2048 like a resonant right so we have a uniform size uh, which is uh, like 768 coming from bird and 768 coming out from vat base right so it is pretty straightforward so we don't have the projection layers we take them we normalize them and then we directly make the feature interaction and then we multiply that with our uh, trainable parameter pass it on to the fully connected layer patch the rest of the steps are pretty straightforward right so these are two layers and then uh, um, yeah then we would try to make the prediction so those are two different uh, networks we want to train here right but before that let's talk about um, the terminology as to uh, what is an early fusion? What is a mid fusion? Why I'm calling them, right? That's an important thing. The next section is I'm going to quickly touch upon that. Uh, so a, quick, a little bit of history before the pre-transformer era, that before transformers invaded uh, the computer vision world in CNN world. Uh, if you're going to do uh, fusion between uh, text and the vision space, uh, there are a couple of different ways. One is you can do it at the feature level, or you can do it at the decision level right so as you can see the screenshot that i highlighted uh, if you're going to take the decisions of individual models like a vision model and then the text model as in this case there is resnet 152 and the bird model and then you combine the results of the actual predictions of the model in some way like in this case a mean of it that was termed as late fusion anything done at a before level like for example before the decision is arrived you're trying to combine it that's called as an early fusion right so that's a pre-transformer era in the vision world in a prose transformer era, uh, things have changed a little bit because uh, if you have a vision transformer and then you have a text transformer, both being the virtue of having uh, transformers, they have their respective encoders, right? So the encoders, based on the encoders interaction, the definition of what is early fusion, late fusion, mid fusion bottleneck has changed. So I just wanted to leave it here for you guys. Not a big deal, uh, but it is, I still consider that as a hijack of terminology uh, based on the advancement of technology. Just This is something that you want to be aware of. Um, so that is not a big deal. Let's, let's keep moving forward. I've uh, linked a couple of references for a recent uh, vision language pre-training survey as to what it means and things like that. So why I've linked this is uh, there is a, a pre-trained modeling uh, paradigm called vision language pre-training where uh, you train models by bringing both the vision and language uh, feature extractors together, right? So that is called as a multimodal pre-training. Both uh, vision uh, leg as well as the text leg are brought together and they both are pre-trained unlike our space so in here what you have done is the pre-trained models are unimodal right we have a unimodal vision uh, model and then there's a unimodal text model and then we fuse it after the uh, fact but this is a different thing where uh, at, at a very early stage those things have been used in pre-training i want you to be aware of the fact that this concept exists for for, uh, for if you don't know already and uh, this is not something we are using we will be using it eventually at this point this is too advanced uh, let's just just leave it at there right and uh, in terms of uh, you know the list of VLP models available. This this uh, this list this long list gives you as to in the do in the image domain 
what are the different models available and what kind of vision feature extractors they use, language feature extractors they use, what is the fusion technique they use in terms of architecture, like single or dual stream, whether to have a de decoder or not, what are the objectives they use, what data sets they use. Uh, why I'm dropping this here is one is uh, to tell you the difference between the exercise we are doing and, and we are definitely not touching upon VLP at the moment. And the second idea of me dropping this here is to show you that as, as you can see, in custom fusion like we did, we have the choice of uh, picking and choosing the vision fusion extractor and language feature extractor and how to fuse. So you have complete independence and the fusion choices and then the feature extractor choices. But in the case of VLP models, however, the lure of having a pre-training at both vision and language level is great and the results are great in paper. The I personally feel for certain tasks that you are constrained by the choice. But that means you don't get to choose the vision feature extractor and language feature extractor all the fusion technique you are just you just have to use the choice that the actual vlp model trainers have made i just want to leave it up there for you guys um, moving on uh, let's just uh, we have just put together a couple of networks and i'm just uh, creating the model uh, instance for both the networks this is the cnn version and this is the transformer version uh, here I'm just initializing the optimizers and the warm-up steps, some basic things that you have to do for any fine-tuning uh, fine exercise. Um, I, the seventh section is for training uh, both the networks individually. I'm not going to actually run the training because it's going to take some time. How? I mean, it's not a lot, but it's still going to take some time. You can go through the steps. Um, the first one is the CNN model. Uh, you know, uh, we see a textbook uh, uh, learning curves. So. Uh, if, that this does not reflect the performance yet. This is only the, the performance on the training and validation data, but nonetheless, it looks good. That's for the CNN version, and this is for the transformer version. Uh, I've used only 10 epochs. Still looks uh, pretty good uh, in the validation data. We're going to look at how these models perform. Has it learned anything at all? Is it performing well on the test slides? We have kept it aside. We're going to look at it. But before that, um, I wanted to give a couple of takeaways, um, right? The important thing, what, what you want to notice is uh, all vision language tasks are not, not made equal. The modality interactions uh, or the fusions depend on the task, right? Like, for example, VQA is one of the, the, the version of the VQA that you saw, the flavor of the VQA you saw is the simplest version, right? Um, look at the images below. This is most... Uh, this is a slightly advanced version, a complicated version of VQA, right? The pizza image is asking questions about how many slices. This is basically a count question. And then the cartoon uh, in the middle is basically is asking, is the person expecting some company? So these are kind of nuanced question, and you uh, probably will have to have a more advanced interaction between the vision and language, uh, unlike what we have shown here. So. Uh, I'm just trying to tell you guys this is the exercise that you've gone through is too simplified for the sake of starting at some point. It's going to get complicated as we move forward. But nonetheless, I'm not trying to uh, scare you off. I'm just trying to say like things are going to change and we will see more techniques and we will, uh, you will learn like how do you choose feature extractors depending on the task and how do you choose the fusion technique uh, depending on the task and things like that. For instance, okay, VQA needs external knowledge. VQA 1 and 2 probably will need region and object-based features, not just vanilla uh, VAT kind of uh, model for, for a vision uh, feature extractor. Right? And obviously, TVQA is a video question answering, which is, uh, which is the next step right? We, when we move from the image domain to video domain. So I just want to leave it uh, out there for you guys to give you a preview as the comp uh, preview on the complexity of the task. And also, uh, I just want to give you a glimpse as to what to expect from here, right? So we're going to look at different kinds of tasks in this series, and we probably will add multilingual into multimodal. Uh, I will probably teach you guys as to how to learn join embeddings, improve the modality interactions, probably add attentions to this. And then I, I just want to take you guys all the way up to a point where you can uh, define your uh, uh, diffusion models like ImageGen where you can take a text and generate images or videos. And, uh, and keep in mind that when I say vision language modeling series, it's just not for the image domain. We will eventually graduate to video domain as well. So it's all... Uh, um, you know, uh, 
in the in in stock so just keep keep that in mind um yeah sorry for the long wait and then uh, now we'll see whether the model has learned something or not by running the inference on the test data uh, again i'm not going to run that for this uh, for the sake of this exercise uh, i'm going to show you the results uh, the section 10 is showing the results the the first part is the the performance of the CNN model on the test data, which is pretty good. And then the second part is the performance of the VAT model on the test data. As you can see, uh, we have not, uh, uh, for the sake of this exercise, we have taken a rather simple variant of the VQA, but we did not build a toy model. I just want to put that out there that we have built a serious model which actually performs well, performs well on the test data. The fusion technique that I introduced is not a tie fusion. It actually works and makes some decent predictions and actually pretty good uh, predictions on the test data. Um, so you can actually uh, apply this somewhere. If the task is as simple as easy VQA, you could actually use it in real world uh, in production wherever you want. I just want to leave it out there that do not think that this is some kind of a tie exercise. That's it. I would like to leave you guys with an update. I'm also working on uh, with a bunch of folks on a library called uh, Light Fuse. The motivation behind the library is pretty simple. Uh, if you have to do VNL modeling downstream tasks, uh, you should not be doing the heavy lifting. Uh, the library will do exactly that. Uh, unfortunately, apart from introducing the library to you, I don't have much information at the moment. Uh, when it is ready for release, which is not going to be too long from now, I will give you an update and then you guys can contribute and support us in uh, any way, shape or form. Uh, so that closes this episode. And um, brass tacks, the link for the notebook and uh, for you guys to follow up with questions, I've established a Slack channel. The link for the, the invite for the Slack channel both will be uh, given to you. Um, so that's pretty much... Uh, uh, what I wanted to cover in this episode and uh, I'll see you guys in uh, another episode. Thanks for your time.